Hi, everyone. It's Michael Lewis. I'm very proud and honored to present you this bonus episode, which is part of Dell Technologies Small Business Podference. So we know how many small businesses are now grappling with the impact of these uncertain times and looking for resources. But a lot of the conferences where people trade ideas, those are canceled right now. So Dell Technologies has organized something they're calling a podference for small business owners, like a virtual conference to share advice and some inspiration. Dell Technologies is here to help you through these times, from keeping you connected and productive while working remotely with Windows 10 and Microsoft Teams, to providing relevant content to help your business. To find more participating podcasts, search Dell Technologies Small Business Podference on Radio.com, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts at the end of this episode. I was asked to moderate a panel with two of my oldest friends, Malcolm Gladwell and Jacob Weisberg. We've known each other since the 1980s when we were all young writers in the magazine business. Malcolm and Jacob are now the co-founders of Pushkin Industries, the company that produces Against the Rules, which is now underway, by the way. Pushkin also makes a bunch of other great shows, like Malcolm's own Revisionist History and The Happiness Lab with Dr. Lori Santos. I've been watching on the sidelines over the past year as Malcolm and Jacob started the company, so I was really happy to have an excuse to ask them all kinds of nosy questions about what they've learned about running a business together and the challenges they face. And the challenges right now in our quarantine world, well, those are unique. You'll get to hear a little bit about that. Here's our conversation. All right, so, because I don't actually know the story, so I would love to know how you decided to to start Pushkin. Jacob, right? It was Jacob's doing. How do you start? Well, I'd started one podcast company already, which was Panoply, which came out of Slate. Uh, But as things evolve, Panoply turned into a technology company. I thought I was starting mainly a content company. And um, one of the shows we'd started was Revisionist History uh, with Malcolm. That show was doing really well. And there were some other shows I was really interested in doing. So it was sort of when the earlier company under a CEO I'd hired, who I thought was making a good decision, wanted to make a pivot that I said, hey, maybe it's time that Malcolm and I started our own company and only do what we want to do. I was on holiday with my family in, I can't remember where. I was somewhere in Europe. Italy. In Italy. And Jacob was in some, I think, if I can tell the truth, a truly horrible house <laughs> in, in Italy. I believe it was a villa. And he said, <laughs> and he said, uh, he said uh, that I, sh- he, he, he summoned me and said, we, there's something crucial we need to talk about. So I was like, I sort of, you know, drove halfway across Italy, show up in this horrible house by the road, and then he, we like sat outside in little chairs and had coffee and he said, I want to start a company. That's how it began. Well, did you say yes right away? Yeah, it struck me as, well, the, the backstory about this is that Jacob has been, I've known Jacob for 35 years. And through, for some significant portion of this, I would always say to Jacob, I don't know why you want to be a journalist you'd be a really great businessman. If you just became a businessman, you, you could make a huge amount of money and we could all get rich. Jacob may have forgotten this, but I would always, and I would always worry that if I, when I said that, I was insulting him because what he really wanted to be was a writer, which, and I wasn't saying he was a bad writer. <laughs> I was simply saying, I thought he'd be an even better businessman. <laughs> so I, I remember you saying this 30 years ago. Uh, and so Jake is a wonderful journalist, but I agreed it, that, he's, he, that he's sort of a natural for this sort of thing. He's got the temperament for it, unlike you or I. But, but you know, what What surprised me, the thing that could take you back even a little further, it surprised me that you two went off on this podcast, Jag, in the first place. You both had very happy, successful careers in the print world. Why did you decide that you wanted to do something different? You know, Michael, I'd gotten the bug really in the early days of podcasting at Slate, where sort of because of a random connection with an NPR show Slate had been working on, we started making some of the first podcasts anybody listened to. And everybody at Slate, all the journalists, loved doing them. And there was this little audience, small at first, but growing, that just loved them. And um, the giveaway was that everybody at Slate who didn't have a podcast wanted a podcast. 
And uh, they were just a joy to do. So, you know, I'm a little evangelical about things I get excited about. And I tried to talk Malcolm into doing one, and I tried to talk you into doing one. And uh, I ultimately talked both of you into doing it. I talked Malcolm into it first. And uh, then I think uh, the fact that he was doing it may have helped to persuade you. Uh, it was worse than that. You got Malcolm to lie to me and say it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did. You lied, but that's all right. Well, I forgive you. So you two, two old friends go into business together. Um, how's it working out? Like, how do you find working with each other? Are you surprised by anything? Are you finding things out about each other that you didn't know that you wish you didn't know? Well, I, I, I'm reminded of a, um, years ago, I wrote a piece that was really about my friendship with Jacob. And it was about the idea that um, what's called um, collective memory which is that we outsource a lot of the things we know to our friends and family. And I was writing about this because of Jacob, saying that Jacob is someone who I respect and trust so much that significant parts of my knowledge and cognition are simply outsourced to Jacob. I was saying that I no longer read anything about politics or try and figure out anything about politics. I simply ask Jacob what he thinks and adopt those ideas as my own. That was my position. And I was sort of a joke, but it's actually true. It's just a way better way to live your life to make, to appoint sort of experts in your friendship circle and outsource everything to them. Um, I do the same thing with my brother in wine and, you know, <laughs> you make a long list. So this is, in business, I've just applied this principle, which is I just let him do all the things that I know he's better at than me. And since that's a rather long list, it means my life is very easy. <laughs> so, so there's, so, is that true, Jacob? Is, is is there no? Are you basically running the business in Malcolm's decoration? Um, no, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I I handle more of the day to day, as they say. But um, yep. honestly, at this point, more of the ideas come from Malcolm, and that's that's a bit of an adjustment because I've always thought of myself as the idea person. But I'm like a you know good idea week person. Malcolm's like a five good idea a day person. And uh, so a big part of my job now is just like being Malcolm's filter to try to well, talk him out of some of the ideas and then try to figure out how some of the others can can happen. Uh, but So these, these are ideas for shows? These are ideas for shows. These are ideas for new businesses. Malcolm has a lot of ideas. And the typical day is, you know, at uh, about 11 a.m., he'll call me and say, uh, this is so much fun. We really don't want to get too big too fast. Let's keep it just like it is. And I say, yeah, Malcolm, I totally agree with that. This is the good part. Let's let's not grow too fast. And then after lunch, he'll call me and he say, all right, I've got three ideas. And each of them would involve like adding like 10 new staff members. And so if we did, if we pursued all of our ideas, we'd have 600 people right now instead of 25. And, uh, you know, that's kind of a tension. I mean, it's not a tension in that Malcolm and I disagree about it. I think we're both pulled in both directions, liking having a small business where, where we know everybody and it's sort of close like a family and we control everything. But then all this opportunity and all these good ideas we want to pursue. Um, in these conversations, are you able to see the possibility of a really big business or do you think it's naturally better as a small business? You, you've hit on the, the hard part. You know, I think we see that we do see the opportunity to be big. I mean, I don't know, you know, when you say really big, I mean, I don't, it's not, I don't think it's, I don't think it's Google big. I don't think it's Facebook big, but in the world of podcasting, I think it has the potential to be really pace setting and, and dominant. Um, but we also want to be really, really choosy and have everything we make really represent what we're interested in and the quality level we, we've set so far. So, you know, I think it's just a kind of working out of those two things will result in the right size. I honestly don't know what the right size is. We're going to get bigger. It's just a question of how fast we're going to get bigger. Malcolm? Yeah, I think what occurred to, I think, all of us very quickly in this um, project, this experiment, is that um, we're not really in the podcast business. We're, you know, it's a cliche. We're in the storytelling business and we happen to want to tell stories through audio. But that means you can compete against all kinds of like we we there's no reason why we can't behave like a book publisher in many respects. Um, it's just that our books are on our audio, not on the page. But once you realize that, well, look at book publishers. They're really big. I mean, they have thousands of employees. They have so you know, conceive that way. If you only think of yourself as being in the podcast world, you 
you might think of yourself as being pretty small. But if you think of yourself as just as using a different medium to tell stories, then there's no reason why you can't be really big. So to all appearances, this thing has been an incredible success and it's been really fun to make a podcast for you. Um, But I'm curious what troubles you've had, especially like um, given the pandemic, how you've had to adjust and respond and 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 um, how much difficulty it's introduced into your business. Well, we've all been improvising in various ways. I think we feel very lucky in that what we make is is makeable under these circumstances. People set up recording studios at home and we have meetings virtually. I don't know that we could have done this with the digital tools that existed 10 or 15 years ago. I mean, things like Zoom and and uh, Slack and Google Hangouts and, and shared drives um, seem so essential to long distance collaboration. I mean, I th- in a way they've arrived just in time and it's sort of the moment for those tools. But we can make our shows, and luckily we work with writers of a caliber, starting with you and Malcolm, who can use their writing to adapt with what they're doing. If there's an interview that you were going to do for your season this year, Michael, and you can't do it, you can write your way out of it. Um, that's not a position a TV producer is usually in. I mean, if you have physical production that requires people to be in a group in a place, it's just got to be suspended. Podcasts, we can we can still make it. It's not all been easy, but people have been incredibly flexible and nimble about how we're still going to get these shows done with this new challenge. So it's funny. I'm about to. I've got five of my seven episodes for this soon, the next, the second season done, but I've got. I've got one that really did require me, I thought, require me to go out onto the road, and I'm not able to do it. And you said to me, you know, you can write your way around this. And this weekend, I'm about to find out whether I can. <laughs> and and I'm kind of wondering if you think that's really true. I mean, what do you think? I, I, what I'm thinking is just generally when you're thrown this kind of um, this kind of curveball, uh, you look curveball and you hit it. That you that you try to just turn it into a strength. Uh, and you see what you can do it, given the given the constraint. But but there's a part of me that thinks you know I hear in my voice the podcast producer saying we need scenes, we need scenes, and now you can't really get those scenes. Um, d- does it tr- does it trouble? Does that trouble you at all? You think ah oh, maybe these could be better this way? Well, I th- I tend to share your view that the constraint provokes creativity and that you often end up with something that's better and more interesting than what you would have had otherwise, but not always. You know, luckily, I think uh, for a number of our shows, we had a lot of the field reporting, the interviews under our belt. And so we're more at risk of losing like 20% of what we wanted. If we hadn't done any, then it would be harder to make those shows. You'd have to conceive them in a different way if they're dependent on vivid scenes where the where where you as the journalist is physically present do you think it's going to change the way when this is over and you can go back to doing it the old way you think you'll go back to doing it the old way you think you actually learn things that you're gonna you're gonna work into your into your routine well my 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 big goal and at one of our earliest meetings we had a retreat very early on at pushkin we sort of sat down and tried to figure out what are the principles that we believe in as a company. It sounds very pretentious. It actually wasn't. Um, and my the one I was encouraging other people to accept was, and we did, was that we should always remember that this should be, above all else, fun. If we're not having fun, we shouldn't do it. It shouldn't be drudgery. And so I always think about my big worry when all the lockdown happened was, will it still be fun if we're all working from home and we can't hang out with this sort of wonderful collection of, and I mean this in the best way, misfits and weirdos that we have gathered <laughs> to make podcasts. <laughs> um, and I number myself among them. Um, so I was like, well, when I can't hang out with these delightful weirdos anymore. Is this not going to be fun? And so I think what's happened is that we've just discovered new ways to hang out. Yeah, my sense is we're building a new muscle and that, it, that, that or that we're a kind of, a, a um a resilience so that you kind of know you can do it knowing you can do it another way is enormously freeing we'll be right back as i mentioned earlier this episode is just one of many podcasts included in the small business podference 
presented by Dell Technologies, a podcast conference to get inspiration on topics like fundraising, building teams, or managing a business in our current environment. From top podcasts like Against the Rules with me, Michael Lewis, Rise with Rachel Hollis, and Rhett and Link from Ear Biscuits. For the complete lineup of episodes, visit DellTechnologiesPodference.com. Welcome back. Here's more of my conversation with Jacob Weisberg and Malcolm Gladwell from Pushkin Industries. Michael, I think there are, you know, two big impacts I've been thinking about on the company. One's cultural and one is more sort of substantive around what we make. But the the cultural point is that a, a company like ours, people are really close and they get very close making creative work together. And we had just moved into this new office in in New York, like literally a week before it was closed and we all had to work work from home and be socially isolated or physically isolated. And uh, that was a bummer. I mean, we were, this office is really great. And, like everybody was really excited to be there. It's clean, it's new. There was really good coffee. Like we couldn't wait to get to work and see each other in the morning. Those of us who are in New York, which is most of the staff. And suddenly that's denied to us. Everybody's worried about everybody. Everybody's got a whole new set of problems. People have to figure out how to take care of their kids, homeschool their kids, worry about their parents. Some people are feeling physical symptoms. Are people getting sick? So you have suddenly, instead of this kind of convening, you're you're separated and and worried. Um, And uh, the the cultural observation is that people then become really um, habituated to and really enjoy in a way the forms of digital connection, having a Zoom meeting once a week where everybody's on it. You just see where everybody is and you see the backdrops. And one of our employees, Sophie McKibben, is up in up in uh, New Hampshire and she, you know, she calls in from her car because that's where she gets the best phone connection. You see her in her car and you see people in their apartments. Some of them have kids running in and out of the frame. And um, it's just, I'd look forward to that so much, just seeing everybody. And I think other people are having the same feeling. And um, as, you know, CEO, I just feel so grateful to these people who've got all this stuff <laughs> they're having to deal with in their lives that they weren't expecting. Um, but they're, you know, but they're doing their best work at the same time. And I think that's partly because work is a refuge in a, in a situation like this. So, Jacob, I have a question for you. You spent most of your life sympathetic to and surrounded by and being one of them. Uh, uh, j- kind of journalists who, who never have to take any responsibility for anything. And you've, you've managed to become pretty naturally like an executive, like a person who runs a thing and sounds like you just sounded. Uh, <laughs> and, and like like you could be secretary of the treasury. It, um, and I, I, I'm wondering where you pick this up. Like, are you reading on the sly, like in the middle of the night, reading these horrible corporate management books? Or are you, uh, do you have some little secret source of wisdom you go to? How did you figure out how to do this, how to run a business? Uh, you know, I think I was watching people uh, do it, and I, and I think I've you know learned a lot from people who weren't so good at it, as well as from people who were who were really good at it. But you know, Michael, I was always just really interested in this problem of how you could pay for high quality journalism or media. Um, we both came out of the magazine world, and it was just this fundamental issue even before the internet and things got challenging, you know, was how do you how do you make money on magazine journalism where someone spends months doing a story? And um, I was, sort of went from being interested in that problem to, to kind of taking on the problem when I was at Slate. And as part of that, we ended up selling Slate and I ended up being responsible for it. And it was an evolution, but I did go kind of in stages from being a full-time writer, editor, to being the head of the business. And I don't know, I think, you know, I think you've uh, both reflected in this conversation that it's fun to try new stuff when you're in your 50s. A lot of people in their 50s don't get to do that. People just want them to keep doing the same thing they've been doing. So if you get an opportunity to try something new at, at this stage of life, you can jump at it and you should jump at it. And for me, that's the business stuff. Uh, Malcolm, I, I, I hope you feel this way. It's weirdly still fun. I feel a little guilty about it being fun now because um, I know how not fun the world is and businesses for, for a lot of people. But it's just seeing how 
we, we've hired incredible people and seeing their resilience and how they've adapted to it, um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a joy. And um, it's, uh, it would be a very different story if it wasn't working, but it feels like we're going to get through it. And it, I feel pretty good about it at the moment. All right. So uh, you guys, t- to my eyes, you guys have never had a, a spat or a disagreement, but maybe you have. And you got, since you've gone into business together, uh, have, you, have there been any sources of disagreement? Well, if anybody's thinking about doing this, it, it is it is riskier in a slightly different way. Starting a business with your best friend, there's there, there's a lot more upside because it's it's a delight to do it. Um, but you know, it's who gets to decide. I mean, you're you have a dynamic that's not always a friend dynamic. I think it's been pretty seamless and easy for me and Malcolm. He can tell you what he thinks, and I don't think we've had. Uh, any any meaningful or significant conflicts, but the you know the one dynamic that I'd point to, which is not my favorite, but it's a reality, is that I've got to say no more than Malcolm does. He's he can come up with with all these ideas, and I've got a little more of the responsibility for figuring out how we can get them done or which ones we can get done. And sometimes I've just got to say, Malcolm, that's you know just like one idea too many. We can't do it. Can you think of an example? Well, you know, Malcolm will like meet someone on a plane and land and send me an email about why they should have a podcast. And I've got to then say, okay, well, let's, you know, I'd love to talk to them and let's hear what their voice sounds like. And, you know, have they ever done any audio before? And, uh, you know, he's, uh, he, He's got very good instincts, and the, it's. The, I guarantee you, those people are interesting. But whether they're going to be the right person to do a show for a whole bunch of reasons is, you know, something we kind of have to figure out. Um, but that's what I mean. Malcolm, this is the the president of Pushkin. That's the the role of the president of Pushkin is to be constantly pushing us to do more, come up with ideas, to be kind of the the creative. Uh, lead. And, uh, you know, then there's, I've, I've got to be the filter. Um, but I think that's working out okay so far. We do, you know, I don't know what percentage of Malcolm's ideas um, bear fruit, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's more than zero and less than all of them. I tried to get us to buy as opposed to rent an office. That was one of my ideas. We went so far as to actually look at some offices with, to buy with real estate agents. And then at the end, Jacob said, you know, I'm not sure we really want to be spending our time and attention managing real estate at this point, which is absolutely correct. But again, left to my own devices, I would have been, you know, careening around New York looking, <laughs> looking at spaces <laughs> with real estate agents um, because I got it in my head that why why wouldn't we own our own place? You know, and I get why that would be fun, example. right? It's like we have a clubhouse, you know, we can like we can we can own it. It can be, you know, podcast Pushkin Central and we can, you know, but it was one, it was already starting to be, you know, we'd spent a couple afternoons looking at real estate, which was which were afternoons we weren't spending on uh, making podcasts or other parts of the business. And also, it sort of occurred to me, well, if you buy a place, it really is uh, going to limit your growth potential. I mean, what if we do want to double in size next year and the office only holds 20% more people? Then suddenly we have the problem of subletting a space and we're in the real estate business. So, yeah, I think that was one of the uh, cases where uh, I maybe had to uh, gently talk Malcolm down from a fun idea. If you if you had to go back and redo the first year of your existence, what would you do differently? I've been, one of the things I've been pushing from the beginning is to think of ourselves as more than a podcast company. And I still, I don't know whether it's a legit concern, but I still worry. I don't want to have us, us to have too many eggs in the podcast basket because I I think of that world as um, it's too unstable for my taste. And I, 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 I have actually gotten, Jacob's been, been an even stronger proponent of this idea than me, I think, at this point. Um, but I wondered, I don't know, if we were doing over the first year, was there, would there have been a way to start more aggressively on that track from the beginning? Maybe, maybe not. When you say diversify out of podcasts, I mean, pet food, what were you going to do? <laughs> no, no, no. Either like book, <clears throat> books, uh, books, events, um, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, producing things for people where you're not dependent on advertising and all those kinds of things, mm-hmm. just diversifying where the money comes from. Right. So you're not, you're not slave to the ad market. Right. Um, that was, that's really, but I actually think I take it back. I actually think we've done a really good job of doing that. Yeah. I mean, I think we, I think we bit off about as much as we could have chewed in, in the first year and a bit. One thing I would have done is I, I would have got the nice office sooner. I mean, the, we, the nice office will be, for me, the fourth office. And if you count my home office, uh, where I'm coming from right now, this is my fifth office in about a year and a half. And, uh, you know, I thought I could save money. Someone gave us free space for a couple months at the beginning. We didn't have that many people. Um, but it does take a little bit of a toll. And, your, you know, your mail never quite all gets forwarded to the right place. So I, w- I think I would have um, said, you know what, we're going to... We're, we're, we're thinking big. We're going to need the nice office. Let's just get it now, even if it's a little empty for a while. Are you in the o- nice office now? Well, theoretically, we are. We moved into yes. it a, yeah, yeah. A, week, a week before um, COVID hit. But um, we, yes, it, we, we, uh, we're looking forward to getting back into it. You don't think there's any risk if you started in the nice office, you wouldn't think of it as the nice office? You think this is the starting office? I, I now need a better office? And- I'd always been haunted by the phenomenon in the media world where the company um, goes, goes to, to hell as soon as they get the nice office. And I think there's a real reason for it, too, which is that everyone gets distracted by the, like, the decorating and the who's going to sit where. And suddenly nobody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Instead, they're all thinking about the office. So I always thought, don't, you know, make the office like the last thing you worry about. But you know what? It's part of like providing a great place for people to work. And it affects the work if you've got a place people want to come to. And, you know, the coffee can't be too good. I mean, you think (laughs) about how good that coffee is. It affects how much you want to be in the space. And that's, you know, how much you want to be in kind of creative conversation with your colleagues. You know, another example of this is I never thought about the important, you know, until you are actually part of it, this is old hat to anyone who's part of a business. Until you're part of a business or starting a business, you don't understand the importance of hiring in quite the same way as you, um, uh, you know, you don't understand like one, how crucial, how one really, really good person it can transform an entire aspect of your business or one bad person can be disastrous. You know, you're, I was always sort of indifferent to those questions. I thought, oh, you know, because I had these kind of arm's length dealings with editors or copy editors or whatever. Who you could, yeah, who you could always get rid of if you didn't want. Our team has been so, so strong that it's almost made us afraid to, to hire people. Because we haven't we haven't got a dud yet, and it, the team works so well together. And I do have this kind of phobia that we're the, eventually eventually we are going to get a bad apple, or not even a bad apple, just someone who's not great. And uh, I just worry when that happens, it's going to change the dynamic, and uh, you know it kind of raises the stakes on every person you hire because they you have to think they are going to be as good as all the people you've already hired. And you're right, you the that you are. You you see, maybe is this this is what you see when you're a, when you're starting out and you're a small business that you might start to lose sight of when you're a giant business and you've got tens of thousands of employees is just the effect of a single person. I finally understand after observing for years with some mystification the obsession entrepreneurs had with hiring. I now understand it. I'm like, oh, I get it now. I don't know why this was a mystery mystery to me. <laughs> you never had to hire anybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> Hey, Michael, let me ask you a question. Um, yeah. This this season's about coaching, and you've been talking to some of the best coaches in the world. You've been thinking a lot about what how good coaches think. What do you think a really good coach would tell us about having a company like ours and what we should be doing or thinking about? I mean, if there was like a, if there was like an entrepreneur coach who could wo- who roll, there probably are. I think there right? is. I don't know if you've yeah, talked no, no, to that person yet, but I'm sure there are coaches for startups and entrepreneurs, but I haven't talked to any of them. I challenge you now to name any activity for which there isn't someone <laughs> who calls themselves a coach roaming around selling their services. That's the thing that's been amazing to me is that it, we, we actually could start with what's the activity we want to write about or, or talk about and go find the coach because you know they're there. Now, what would a, what would a really good... Uh, so the... I'm not persuaded that so it is true, I think, that the best place to insert coaches is your kind of situation, where transitional states. Um, 
And uh, I bet, I bet the, the, with the, what the coach, what a coach would do with you is just ask you lots of really difficult questions that even I don't want to ask you. Uh, and, and take you, um, try to figure out where you might go wrong. Like, I bet if I was guessing what, what, the, what the risks you guys run are, or we run, as I am part of your business, um, is that the depth of your friendship is so deep that it's hard to me, um, for me to imagine um, you choosing the success of the business over the success of your friendship. And if there is ever a moment where those two things conflicted, the friendship would survive, but the business would take a hit, which I love, but I think that's true. So yeah, that's how it should be. I think we, I think we both feel that way. Hopefully we won't face that conflict. You know, I don't think you will, but I think when I think about, I, I think a coach would come in and say, you guys are doing great, right? This is an awesome, it's an awesome startup and all, everything's going well. I think the coach would come in and say, what's the risks? Let's see if we can analyze what 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 we should be thinking about might come down the pike and 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 sort of prepare you for them. Um, do you have anybody like that in your life who's who's kind of coaching you on the side? Is Michael Linton doing it? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's who's, a it's, mutual friend of all of ours, Michael Michael Linton, who was. CEO of Sony and has a lot of experience working in a lot of different kinds of businesses. And um, he is both um, very much available for for advice for, for me, but also um, offers it unsolicited at really good times, including when this crisis hit. You know, he he sort of called me up and, and said, you know, he wanted to make sure that we were kind of thinking about these questions about our, our cash position and our resiliency and also about, he just wanted to ask me about how I was communicating with the staff and making sure people knew what was going on and there weren't rumors going around. And it's uh, it's great to have someone like that. I, re- I rely on him a lot, both the, both the advice he gives me and that I know he's thinking about the business and has experience I don't have with small businesses. So Michael's kind of your coach. Yes, I think. So. Yeah. yeah, he is. He is for me. He is. He is definitely my uh, CEO coach. I'm curious. I've meant to ask you when you went off on this retreat, the retreat at which Malcolm introduced the idea of fun as a founding principle, uh, which I totally agree with. That if we're not having fun, that the audience is unlikely to have fun either. Uh, is what were the other principles that were sort of your core, that you regard as your core principles? I don't even remember fun, which tells you a lot about. <laughs> <me. laughs> Mia LaBelle, who's her executive producer and has been the executive producer of Malcolm's show since the beginning. She's someone who came with us from from the old company, um, is you know very important person in establishing our culture. But she talks a, a lot about kindness as a as a principle of the company. And um it's really it's really true. And I think she's been the kind of guardian of it. But it's the way people think about working together and how they help each other and support each other. And then that ties into, I think, a bunch of other ethical principles, not just about integrity, journalistic integrity, business integrity, um, but, you know, uh, diversity, the kind of workplace we want to create, the kind of society we want to see modeled in the company. Um, so people have a lot of feelings about it. And when you have a young workforce, those getting that stuff right and having that all be relevant, meaningful people to people um, is crucial in recruitment and retention. Because you've got to not just be a place where people can do interesting work. I think you've got to be a place where people want to work. How do you get across your values to someone who's coming in and thinking of working for you? I think they have to, I think that they don't hear it from this CEO. I mean, hopefully they do hear it from the CEO, but I think people only believe it when they hear it from peers and see that peers are having that kind of experience right. uh, in, in the place they work. And uh, you kind of you know, can't think, hide, you, you can't hide who you are, especially as a company, right? As a person, some maybe a little bit, but as a company, you know, word just will spread of what it's like there. The values come, they, they do come through. And I think it's especially true with startup companies because they grow up so quickly that they end up being kind of projections of the values and, and beliefs of the, of the founders. And, um, 
you know, I think that's true at Facebook in one way, at Uber in another way, but it's, it's, it's even more true at a, at a smaller business. Everything that you you believe gets reflected in some way in the in the company. Thanks again to Jacob Weisberg and Malcolm Gladwell of Pushkin Industries. You can hear more of Dell's Small Business Podference by searching Dell Technologies Small Business Podference on Radio.com, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. Special thanks to Emily Rostek, Carly Migliori, Julia Barton, Heather Fain, and Jason Gambrell. I'm Michael Lewis.